Okay, um, what we're going to start out with today is Shine, Jesus, Shine. But as we start, I was just listening to Pastor this morning talking about prayer, and it's in our heart. So is praising God. You know, so we're praising God, we're praying to Him as we're praising Him. So just remember, just sing with your heart when we start singing these songs. Okay, we're going to start singing Shine, Jesus, Shine. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 8, 12. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place in place. Set our hearts on fire. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I came to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me each time we consume all my darkness. Father's glory, place, spirit, place, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so Display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirror, hear me, our eyes tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit. and mercy send forth your word Lord and let there be light each one of us is a light we must shine all this this world right now we need our light right <laughs> okay you may be seated <clears throat> so as we're shining our light you need to know that we are Christians By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John 13, 35. Yes, they'll know we are Christians. 
questions by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, His only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know. Let that light shine. <laughs> okay, our next one is Here I Am, Lord. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah 6 8. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright who will bear my light to them whom shall I send here I am Lord is it I Lord I have heard your calling in the night Till their hearts be 
satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard your calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you read the word and each one of us have a calling to do something okay we're going to end with our medley bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name Psalms 103 1 song I 
Thank you. Thank you, Father, for being our God. I thank you for the Holy Spirit you put in us, Lord. I just pray that this music just expresses our love for you, Lord. I do ask that Pastor Rick, with his message, that you just bless him. Let the words sink deep in our heart, Lord. We need these words in our heart so we can use them for thy glory in every way. And I ask this all in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 1 through 25. And then we'll cover chapter 9, verses 32 through 43. And I want to talk today on serving the Lord. I know that uh, probably all of us here would say that we really want to serve the Lord to the best of our ability. And that's what I want to speak about today, is how to serve the Lord effectively. Now, up to this point, as we've been studying the life of Peter, we've been gaining some very valuable life principles from our studies of his life. Principles such as... uh, What we need to do to gain spiritual power in our lives, we've talked about how to get the most out of life, becoming a balanced believer, and we shared on how to prevent spiritual sinkholes. We've also learned how to get back with God when uh, when we falter in our faith. We've spoken about magnets how to become a magnet for Christ, and how to respond when God is working in our lives. For our lesson today, Luke, who was the writer of the book of Acts, Luke uh, shifts the emphasis now from Peter over to Stephen, and then we'll learn a uh, a little bit about Philip as well, but uh, he, he shifts the emphasis from Peter to Stephen. Now remember, Stephen was one of those seven that, uh, that was called uh, actually to be the first deacons in the church. They were, they were called to uh, oversee the food, the, the food distribution in the early church, according to Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And then in uh, verses 8 through 14 of Acts chapter 6, we read that Stephen, it says, being filled with the Holy Spirit was full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. And Stephen was a very dynamic uh, speaker as well. And because... He was such a dynamic and effective preacher, he is then apprehended and taken before the council of the Sanhedrin. Remember we talked about that, jealousy will cause a person to do things that they ought not to do. It brings about great persecution on the church and and, uh, those who are uh, speaking on behalf of our Lord. And so he's doing that, and he's very effective at doing that. Many people are coming to know Christ, and the Sanhedrin, of course, they are jealous, and, and uh, they have him arrested, taken before them. And, and what they do is they go out and they get a false witness, and he is introduced to testify that they heard they heard him speaking and it says blasphemous words against this holy place and the law and that he had also said that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses had delivered to them 
So when asked by the high priest if these accusations were true, Stephen preaches a very powerful message to them as well in which he condemns the the Sanhedrin for resisting the Holy Spirit and then he accuses them of betraying and murdering Jesus, the Messiah. In fact, listen to what he calls them. He says, you are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. He also tells them that they always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. And when they hear this, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. I think they were a little ticked off at him. Then we're told in Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56, it says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And when they heard that, we're told in verses 57 and 58, then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They all laid their coats at the feet of a young man by the name of Saul. who the Bible says was consenting to his death. And what happened as a result of that was that there was a great persecution against the church that it scattered believers throughout Judea and Samaria. But we read that the apostles remain in Jerusalem. Great persecution came upon the church. And all the believers were scattered. You know, sometimes that's the way God gets us off of our duffs and out into the mission field in the world and sharing the gospel. His persecution comes. You see, and you read about it today, in the countries where there's the heaviest amount of persecution, there's the most amount of preaching the kingdom gospel and people coming to Christ. Oh, how our country needs a revival right now. And we need more people that will stand up and get out and share the kingdom gospel. We're told in Acts chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial. But as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And then in the remainder of of chapter 8, in the last part of of chapter 9, we discover how to serve the Lord effectively ourselves. How can I serve the Lord effectively? Two things we're going to learn about serving the Lord effectively this morning. In order to serve the Lord effectively in our lives, the first thing we must do is this. Number one, avoid the attitude of Simon the sorcerer. We read about him in in chapter 8. Simon the sorcerer. Avoid the attitude of Simon the sorcerer. Now, after Stephen is killed, the focus shifts to Philip. 
Another one of the seven men from Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Philip was an evangelist, and he preached throughout the whole region. And because of the miracles that God was performing through him, and because of his powerful preaching as well, we're told in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, that the Samaritans, it says this, believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Many more people were coming to faith in Christ. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard about that, according to verse 14, they, they sent Peter and John. They want to check it out. At this point, even the apostles are still uncertain whether the Gentiles, which were non-Jews, they were Samaritans, Samaritans were, were half-Jews, and so even the apostles were uncertain as to whether they could really be saved. The Samaritans were despised, by the way, by the Jews. Uh, because after entering the, uh, into Assyrian captivity, the northern kingdom of Israel intermarried with the Gentiles, becoming what, what they called mixed ancestry Jews, or uh, they were called Samaritans. They were not welcomed at the temple in Jerusalem, so they built a rival temple out at uh, Mount Gerizim. And that's where they worshipped. And we read in, in uh, uh, John chapter 4 verse 20, you recall the, the story of Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. And this is what she said. She said, our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Now, remember I said the, the apostles sent, uh, was it Peter and John? To check things out. And when they arrive, they, they find the Samaritan believers are genuine in their faith. But those new believers had not yet received the Holy Spirit. According to Acts chapter 8 verses 15 and 16. Now a lot of people said, well listen, I thought that the instant we accept Christ as our Savior, He sends the Holy Spirit to us. And, and, and we receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives. And that's true, but there's a reason why God had not sent them the Holy Spirit yet. The reason I believe is probably because, the, because of their religious beliefs. God wants the Samaritans to realize the truth that Jesus spoke to that Samaritan woman at the well over in John 4.22. He said this, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. The Samaritans may have thought that their Christianity was different from that of the Jews. And so by withholding the Holy Spirit from them until Peter and John arrived, God knew that the unity of those Samaritan believers and the Jewish believers would be confirmed. That they were all Part of one family, the family of God. Just like <clears throat> as we become believers here and, and there's believers in uh, Mexico and Germany and India and, 
And wherever in the world, we're all members of one family, the family of God. And that there need to be unity in the family of God. We sang that song, and they'll know we are Christians by what? Our love. Our love for one another. It's what Jesus told his disciples. And the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And love for one another brings about that unity with one another. Verse 17, we're told that Peter and John laid hands on the Samaritan believers, and it says, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 18, there's a, a sorcerer there by the name of Simon. And he sees these amazing display of power. And so he goes up to Peter and John, and he offers them money. If they will give him the power to lay hands on people so they could receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Simon himself, by the way, claimed to be a believer who was also baptized. And as we see in verse 13, it says, Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Listen, folks, I, I, we, need to, we need to really understand this. There is a difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. There's a, a believing with your mind and believing in your heart. People can believe in their mind all they want to that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God who's come to this earth. But if it's not in your heart, if it's not in your heart, that's not true belief in Christ. It's what Romans chapter 10 teaches us. With the heart, one believes unto salvation. With the heart. Notice in verse 20 how Peter responds to Simon's request. Peter says to him, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money? Oh, it is so sad today that so many people who think they can earn their way to heaven by giving money to the church or, or to charities or by their good works. The kingdom gospel message is this. You cannot buy or work your way to heaven. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. And it doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how generous you are with your money. It doesn't matter how much you work. It doesn't matter how much you volunteer around the church to do work or anything like that. You cannot enter the kingdom of God except through Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen? Amen. That's what we're taught in John 14, 6. Jesus said that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now Peter goes on to tell Simon in verses 22 and 23, he says, Repent, therefore, of your wickedness. Because he's not right in God's sight. And they also, uh, P, uh, uh, Peter also tells him that he is poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. In verse 24, Simon asks Peter to pray for him so that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. 
In other words, do, do you, you get what he's saying? He's saying, Peter, pray for me that none of those things that you've spoken is going to happen to me. In other words, he's more concerned with avoiding judgment than he is with truly repenting. And sometimes that's what happens in people's lives. They're more, they're more uh, concerned about the judgment that's to come than they are about truly repenting and giving their lives totally over to Christ. They, want their, they just want to be able to get on the bus. They want that free ticket ride. The Greek word, by the way, Simoni, S-I-M-O-N-Y, it, it comes from the name of Simon the Magician. It's where they get that, that name Simoni from. Simoni is defined as the buying or selling of sacred or spiritual things. Anytime we do something in the name of the Lord, but just want to be in the spotlight, or just want to impress people, or, or improve our reputation, or, and we've seen this in the, ha in, in the past, many politicians will all of a sudden get religion and attend certain churches, and you know, there's always a photo op of them going to the church and, and everything, and they do that, why? To get votes. And whenever they do that, are we trying to impress people? Or to improve our reputation? Then we're guilty of Simone. Which Peter says is wickedness. Or sin. So after validating the conversion of the Samaritans. Peter and John go back to Jerusalem. And as they return... They preached the kingdom gospel in, in many of the Samaritan villages around the area. And, and, and the gospel was spreading into Samaria. Just like Jesus said it would. Remember in, in, uh, in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And throughout all Samaria. You're going to be my witnesses. Now the rest of chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, is a record of the encounter that Philip has with an Ethiopian eunuch as he obediently follows the instructions of an angel of the Lord, takes a different route going home, and then he is given an opportunity to witness to and to lead this Ethiopian eunuch to faith in Christ. And he baptizes him right there. Whenever we do not, whenever we do not follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we miss some great opportunities. We miss an opportunity to witness for the loss. We miss opportunities to share the kingdom gospel or to share our, our testimony. I remember times of that happening in my life. As I'm driving down the highway going to, to a meeting or something and, and I see this car along the side of the road and, and I'm, you know, I, I want to stop but I'm, man, I'm, I don't want to be late for my meeting. But the Lord's just prompting me Stop and help. Stop and help. So I pull over and stop. And I'm helping this young individual who's having, having some car problems. As a result of that, we got into a conversation. And that day they prayed to receive Christ. Became a Christian. Many other opportunities like that has, has happened where I was going one place and just felt like, well, I need to stop over here and do this. 
and had opportunity to, to meet someone who was having some real difficulties in their life at the time and had the opportunity to, to, to pray with them. God will impress upon us through his Holy Spirit to go certain places, do certain things, because there's opportunities he, that he wants us to have to share our faith with others. We must heed the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. To serve the Lord effectively, we must avoid the attitude of Simon the sorcerer. Secondly, we must appropriate the authority of prayer. Appropriate the authority of a prayer. I'm so glad we sang about that this morning. Prayer. Prayer is so important in, in our lives. I like that song. Prayer is a key to heaven. But faith unlocks the door. And that's what it is. Prayer is the key to heaven. Without prayer, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven because you must pray to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And prayer can move mountains. I've seen through prayer, miracles happen. People come into life again. People being instantly healed of, of uh, diseases or ailments that they've had. Prayer is important. And I'll tell you this. The more we pray, the closer we get to God. I, I like, I have a lot of good friends. Probably have a few enemies too, but I have a lot of good friends. And, and I, like to, I like to just sit down and talk sometimes with some friends just to share some things. And uh, it, it, it's interesting, uh, this past week I was invited to, to go over for lunch with uh, the Bernos. And I sit in their place and we, we had a great time of conversation and, and talking with one another. And I would share some things from my heart with them and they would share some things with me. You know what prayer is like that? That's what prayer is with God. We're having a conversation with God and we listen and allow him to have a conversation with us through his word or through his Holy Spirit speaking in our hearts. Prayer is so important in developing a close, intimate relationship with God. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 31, Luke records the story of the conversation of Saul, who later becomes known as the Apostle Paul. After recording Saul's conversion, Luke returns to focusing on the ministry of Peter. Now we've come back around again to Peter. Peter is now traveling around the country. And his, his task is to strengthen and to encourage new believers, as we're told in, in uh, Acts 9.32. He, he, he uh, visits a place called Lydda. And he's visiting the believers in there to, to give them encouragement and to disciple and mentor with them. Lydda, by the way, is about 25 miles uh, northwest of Jerusalem. Today, uh, it's called Lod. It's the, the hub of, of uh, Israel's main international airport. So while Peter's in Lydda, he heals a paralytic who has been bedridden for over eight years. And as a result of this miracle, according to Acts chapter 9, verse 35, it says, All who dwelt at Lydda 
And Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. An entire community comes to Christ because of a miracle that was performed at that time. I've seen that happen in India. Uh, we were there several years ago. And uh, we prayed for healing for this. She was, a, by the way, a witch doctor. And uh, we prayed for healing for her. And God healed her just like that. And she gave her life to Christ. And it was shortly thereafter that in, that, that whole community came to the Lord. Built a church right, right there. And there's several of the villages that we were at that did the same thing. They, you, 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 some, you know, God performs a miracle. God does a mighty work. And people come to the Lord. And pretty soon the whole community comes to the Lord. And that's what happened here. As Peter was going around preaching. So, the area of Sharon is the surrounding coastal plain. In Acts, we, we can clearly see that signs, miracles, were, were actually signs of Jesus' power. And, and they were designed to lead others to Christ. So news of the healing of this paralytic spread to the port cities of Joppa, which is about 10 miles northwest of Lydda. Joppa was a home of a believer whose name was Tabitha. The Greek word was named Dorcas. Some of you have probably read about Dorcas in the Bible. In Acts chapter 9 verse 36, we read that Dorcas was a woman full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. She made a big difference in the church. So her death would be a huge loss to the church. And because Tabitha is, is dying... The believers in Joppa, when they hear that Peter was near Joppa, they send two men out to, to fetch him. And God uses great people like Peter with great preaching talents. But he also uses people like Tabitha. Tabitha who had the gift of compassion, the gift of, of giving, the gift of service. I know some people don't like to be called out, but, but let me tell you something. We have some ladies in our church that have the gift of compassion. They have the gift of service. The gift of giving. And, and that's so important in, in, in every church. In the body of Christ. It's important. Whatever our spiritual gifts may, may be, we need to remember what we're told over in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each one of us has been given a spiritual gift. And God expects us to use that spiritual gift to minister to one another. Not to hold back, but to minister to one another. There is an area in our church that every one of us can feel a need for. You have a spiritual gift for that area. Whether it's the gift of helps, the gift of mercy, the gift of giving, the gift of, of, of being a prayer warrior, the gift of teaching, 
the gift of music, whatever that gift is God has given you, He wants you to use it to build up the body of Christ. So when Peter arrives in Joppa, he finds several widows, probably some who Tabitha had helped at one time or another. And they're, they're in their room and they're crying because she's already dead. Peter sends them all out of the room and he gets down on his knees and he prays. And then he turns to Tabitha and he says, Tabitha, arise. Tabitha opens her eyes and immediately sits up. Peter then takes her by the hand, helps her to her feet. And then he calls everyone back into the room. Now, this is the first time that one of the apostles raises someone from the dead. I think there's two important things that we can glean <clears throat> from Peter's prayer. Number one is this. We should pray privately. We should pray privately. Peter sent everyone out of the room before he prayed. Whenever we want to pray in earnest, oftentimes we need to be alone with God when we pray. If we only pray in public, we're just like those hypocrites who only pray so people can hear them or see them praying, think they're so religious and holy. See, Peter is not concerned with impressing people, and neither should we be. He only wants to get through to God. There is power in private prayers when they are prayed sincerely and when they are prayed in faith. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus instructed his disciples on how to pray powerful prayers. He says this, but you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who is in secret will reward you openly. And that is exactly what Peter did. He cleared the room, got on his knees, prayed to the Father in secret and you know what? God answered his prayer openly. Listen, our prayers are most powerful when they're prayed privately. Where we only have an audience of one. And that's God. Because see then, we're not praying to impress folks. I've been in churches where I've heard people pray and you, you know that the you can just sense that prayer wasn't really sincere in their heart. They're just saying a lot of things to impress a lot of people. To make people think they're so holy and mighty. I was in a, a meeting one time where a gentleman was asked to pray. And he stood up and he prayed. And he prayed, I believe, you know, in his mind there was nobody in that room but him and God. And he prayed a prayer that he didn't have to use those holy words, Thou art this, and O Lord, we call upon thee to come down and listen to our prayers. He just said, God, this is your child. Gave his name. He said, I'm just here to talk about this burden I have on my heart with, with this person, and I want to pray for them. I mean, he was very sincere in his prayer. That was a powerful prayer. He wasn't trying to impress anyone. Neither should we. Pray in private and God will answer openly. So we need to pray privately. Secondly, we should pray positively. Positively. Peter 
when he's praying, it was interesting to read this. Not once does it say that Peter looked over at Tabitha's body while he's praying. Why is that? It, I think it's probably because the sight of her dead body may have discouraged his faith. She's not moving. She's dead. In order to be positive in our prayers, we cannot focus on our difficulties. Focusing on our problems only hampers our faith. We learn that from Peter's experience when he walked on water. When he concentrated and focused on that boisterous storm, the wind and everything, what happened? He began to sink. He took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. When we're praying, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord, not on our problems. We should not focus on our difficulties and our problems, those storms in our lives, lest we forget the promises and the power of God. Of course, I believe this, we can't be like ostriches and stick our heads in the sand and ignore our problems. But we must not concentrate solely on them either. When, when we pray, we shouldn't just focus on the problem at hand, but on the wonderful promises that Jesus has given us. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. says, Therefore I say to you, whatever you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, of course, I believe this too. Prayer must be according to God's will. And we must be praying with a clean and sincere heart. We can't approach God with unconfessed sin in our lives. Because then God will not listen to our prayer. The, the only prayer he wants to hear at that time is a prayer of confession and repentance. And once we, we, we have done that with him and we're clean in our hearts, then we lay our requests before him. Again, as a result of that miracle, a lot of people in Joppa come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. So according to verse 42 and 43, Peter stays there for a lot of days with a tenor by the name of Simon. He stays in Joppa in order to, to disciple those new believers because he knows that, that a faith built on a miracle alone will be very shaky. And he wants them to grow in their faith. It's noteworthy to, to learn that Peter stays with a tanner, a leather maker, because tanners were considered to be ceremonially unclean, according to Leviticus chapter 11 and verses 35 through 40, since they, they were in regular contact with dead animals. So Peter is also moving closer to understanding the magnitude of God's amazing grace. 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 So important. Because it was by God's grace that, that we have received His mercy and have been forgiven of our sins. Tabitha's sickness, death, and resurrection resulted in many people coming to the Lord. So, guys, listen. God often uses our sufferings or our problems to impact other people's lives. The Apostle Paul understood this spiritual truth so well. During his time in prison... He wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, he says, But I want you to know, brethren, 
that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. God used the problems, the, the suffering that Paul went through in his life to affect the lives of other people as well. And he'll do that with our lives too. Oh, that we too would be bold to speak the word of God. To, to share our faith without fear. And to learn to serve the Lord effectively. In order to serve the Lord effectively, we must avoid the attitude of Simon the sorcerer. And we must appropriate the power of prayer. I'm going to ask Trudy to come and, and play on the piano a little music for us. And we don't often do this, but I really felt moved this week to do this. We hear about how important it is for us to use our talents and our gifts that God's given us for building up the body of Christ, serving one another. And, and we've learned that prayer is so important in our lives. And we've, we've learned that, that we have, listen, we have a part in the, old, the worldwide ministry of Christ. And so I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what we've shared this morning. Serving the Lord effectively. Go ahead. And I'm going to ask that if you'll make that commitment this morning. You might say, God, I, I haven't really been doing all that I know I can do to further your kingdom. And I want to make that commitment this morning to do that. God, I haven't been praying for people like I should have been. I want to make that commitment to you. I want to recommit my life to you right now to do that from this time forward. I want to serve you with all my heart, with a pure heart. So if, you're, if, if, if you want to do that, if you want to come down and, 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 and I'll pray with you, or if you just want to sit there where you're at and just give it over to the Lord. And maybe there's something in your life that you're dealing with right now that's a heavy burden on you. And you want to just turn that over to the Lord. Give it to God. He can handle it better than you can. Our Father God, Lord, we just come before you, sinners saved by your grace. Just wanting to, to serve you effectively. And just as we sang earlier in that song, Lord, you know, uh, whom will I send? And, and the response was, here I am, Lord, send me. God, are you dealing with someone's heart this morning that you, you want to send them to a certain place or a certain uh, 
job or or whatever to serve you. Touch their hearts now, Lord. Father, is there is there an area where you want us to be effective in our ministry for you? Show us, Lord. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would use us. Help me, Lord, to be more effective in the ministry you've called me here to. to be more faithful in my prayer times, my study of your word. Lord, we might be a small church in this community, but we've got people that are mighty in their hearts with love for you. Let that love flow out into our community. God, thank you. Thank you for for inviting us to be part of your family and for adopting us into your family. That we can be called children of the living God. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. to you and I surrender it all to you this morning let's stand as we are dismissed with our closing song praise God from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him blessings flow. Amen. Praise him. Praise him. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.